Um, I'm going to talk about putting the learning back in machine learning. Uh, my background, software engineer turned researcher, Harvard professor, and now CEO of a company called SIFT. Uh, our whole reason for being is to make value-based care wildly successful. Uh, I've been doing this for about 15 years in various capacities. And uh, because they are the right tools for the job, I've been working with machine learning, natural language processing. And I was a little bit bummed when we started calling it artificial intelligence and AI. And I can tell you that in probably five years' time, the idea that a vendor would be able to stand in front of you and say, I have AI or machine learning in my software, in my solution, will be as laughable as me claiming I have a database behind my technology. Uh, this, is, this is just where this is going but it has nothing to do with the images and, and the dialogue surrounding these technologies today. And if we're going to be in a position to make value-based care work, uh, we need to square up with what this stuff is or isn't. And the first thing to know is that artificial intelligence is neither artificial nor is it intelligent. It's just math. It's software, right? It's math we learned how to automate. Now, it's very important math. Uh, if you think about it, math that allows us to collect millions of data points and to learn from that, to analyze, optimize, to predict, to personalize our recommendations, that's a pretty fundamental improvement. I mean, now we have the ability to learn from a lot of data in ways we couldn't in the past. And it's that that matters. It is a new capability that allows us to learn in ways we had not. And companies are revolutionizing their space by using this new capability in ways that others had not thought to do. They're not downloading robots to replace humans. They are embedding learning and improvement in their daily operations. The opportunity now for healthcare, particularly for value-based care, is can we figure out how to embed learning improvement in our daily operations? You're now becoming like those other companies. You're taking on risk. You have a fixed amount of money with which to succeed or fail, and that is very different than how healthcare has been paid for in the past. And so your success will be dependent on your ability to learn and improve. And not once every six months or a year, but daily, based on thousands of opportunities. The challenge and the one takeaway I want all of you to have uh, from this is that we have not yet been prepared to do this. The way we think about and use information technology and data in healthcare is extremely different than the way it is used in other industries. And that is the first challenge that we're going to have to square up with if we're going to use these technologies to get better. In healthcare, we mostly use data to prove compliance. Some 90 plus percent of our analytical talent is dedicated to demonstrating to a third party that we are achieving value by their definitions. Could you imagine if Google dedicated 90% of its resources to prove that they were compliant with Sarbanes-Oxley or something like that? It's just outrageous. As a result of this sort of one-size-fits-all approach to value, which is shifting slowly but surely, we have to square up with the fact that improvement is not one-size-fits-all. What matters for your organization may be different than what matters for yours. And so this notion that we can download a third-party product which tells us how to get better, that assumes that everyone has the same patience and the same data and cares about the same results for the same interventions is a dangerous one, an expensive one, and one that if we continue to go down the path of will cause us to fail expensively. I'll just give you an example, one that I think should be a familiar one. The way we figure out who needs our help using analytics is mostly based on a risk score. So we have a population of patients, some small percent hopefully is going to be readmitted within 30 days. We take an algorithm that was created 15 years ago by researchers in Ottawa, which is designed for a non-complex population that considers four basic data points, uses a fraction of the data we have. And from this, we figure out who is going to need our help medically. Could you imagine for a moment if Amazon were to buy a third-party population book-selling software that considered things like length of book, age of reader, content, and enjoyment laughable, and they wouldn't dare do that to sell more books, but we do this to figure out who's going to be hospitalized. Now, the answer is not to then use machine learning to create a better risk score, right? That's taking a new capability and applying it the old way. The opportunity that others have capitalized is to rethink the work in light of what is now possible. This is matching capability to need in ways that we haven't really done in healthcare when it comes to data and information technology. And I'll give you an example, and we're seeing this happen in the industry. I have machine learning. I have social determinants. I have more data. 
I'm going to give you a better CMS 30-day readmission risk score. You're in value-based care now. Is all that matters really a 30-day readmission risk? Or do you, in fact, now care about admissions? And not all admissions are the same. We work a lot in behavioral health, and the organizations we work with tell us 30 days is too short. I need 90 days to get out there and make a difference. So we're moving the target. And I don't think any clinicians in this room would consider there to be such thing as an average patient or an average admission, yet that is the implicit assumption in the methods we've used. What Amazon and others have figured out how to do is to break a population into very small, bite-sized, actionable chunks. You're not all the same consumers. We're not all the same patients. One could need palliative care for end of life. One could be a falls risk. Uh, what, we can move into the operational. We can try to figure out why are people not showing up or leaving our network. They're not all leaving. They're not all at risk for the same exact reasons. The opportunity here is to break the population into really small, bite-sized, actionable chunks and do something different than we have been doing in the past. Dial for dollars, calling me at home at 5 p.m. to see if my diabetes is doing okay is not going to fly when we take on real risk. If we identify opportunities to do things differently, that means we're now in the change business. Because what's going to happen is you're going to start doing things differently. And that's workflow and process and education and measurement. And that's an expensive game. So you're going to need executive support throughout. If you're going to start using learning in different ways, pick a problem that can make it all the way down the value chain to implementation and ongoing improvement. In healthcare, we tend to look at learning and improvement, or at least data, as being IT's job. The success of other companies and other industries is not based on the CIO picking a product, the team installing it, and then the actual users coming along and hopefully logging in within the next quarter, right? This is very different. These other companies for multidisciplinary teams that identify the highest priority based on ROI, use all of the data at their discretion to figure out what they should and should not be doing, affect change, and here's the most important thing. Then they have to keep measuring whether or not what they're doing is working. And in healthcare, particularly in care management, far too often we do something different, and then in a year we look at MLR or TME, and we say, well, what do we think worked? And we give ourselves a high five and we go on to the next project. So measure what matters, not just what you're told to measure, but what the team, working together arm in arm, decides. These are the things we're going to have to improve upon. These are the metrics that tell us whether or not it's working. And if you're lucky, they may be HEDA scores or some other measure that's been handed to you. But more often than not, when you break a problem into small parts and you do something different, then what you need to measure needs to be based on what the team says matters most for the patient and the bottom line. It's just a very different way of thinking about it. But it's not novel. If these guys can do this to sell books and sell ads and move trash, I'd like to believe that with some of the smartest people in the world working in healthcare, we can think differently about how to achieve change as well. And we can go on and be impressed with how they sell books and ads and trash and classify the difference between a chihuahua and a blueberry muffin, <laughs> uh, or, or how they can compete on Jeopardy, or this is my personal favorite, how they can go on and, and ruin a perfectly good child's book like Where's Waldo by, by taking all the fun out of it. <laughs> These are actual and legitimate uses of machine learning. My sincere hope, though, is that you, in this position to affect change with value-based care, will think outside the box and start to use these technologies to make patients better. And when you decide to do so, I sure hope that you'll remember to give us a call so we can try to help you out. Thanks.